Do you believe in ghosts? No? Well, perhaps not. But then, a week ago, neither did the Howells family, who lived in this house here in Rom the Past Year of 20, a 25-year-old husband, David, and their two young children, are convinced that the house has been invaded by a poltergeist. Mrs. Howells describes what happened on Monday afternoon. Well, it was about five o'clock in the evening, and I just poured my little girl a cup of tea in my mother's room. I went out the back kitchen, and as I opened the door, this bottle came flying towards me. And, of course, I shut the door to protect myself. I opened it again, and I see this other bottle. So I just picked up the children, and I ran up the house. As I ran out, my husband was coming down the street here, and uh, he ran straight in the house, and by the time he got in there on, the place was turned upside down. The curious word poltergeist, of course, comes from old German folklore. It means a noisy spirit. In fact, it's just one of the many European words for things that go bump in the night. Our ancestors thought of the poltergeist as something just akin to the spirits of nature that haunt meadow and field or make noises in the mines. In fact, their idea of the poltergeist was very like that of a modern child's conception of an elf or goblin. In one very famous case, 300 years ago, in the house of John Mompesson, the squire of Tidworth on Salisbury Plain, people heard the beating of a drum. For an hour together it would beat round heads and cuckolds and several other points of war, as well as any drummer. After this, they would hear a scratching under the children's bed, as if by something that had iron talons. It returned with mighty violence and applied itself wholly to my youngest children, whose bedsteads it would beat when there has been many of strangers as well as ourselves present in the room. Though we did at every blow expect they would have fallen in pieces, then it will run under the bedsteads and scratch as if it had iron talons and heave up the children in the bed and follow them from room to room and come to none else but them. In 1695, on this site where the Divinity School now stands, there was a house where a poltergeist was raging. There came by Mr. Isaac Newton, a very learned man, fellow of Trinity College, and seeing several scholars about the door, oh ye fool, says he, will you never have any wit? Know ye not that all such things are mere cheats and impostures? Fie, fie, go home for shame, and he would not go in. Superstition had to give way to skepticism. Skepticism seems natural enough in these scientific times, symbolized so well by the sweeping curves of the great dome of New Hall, calculated, I sincerely trust, according to Newtonian mechanics, to withstand the pull of gravity, but do the scientists really know all the forces that there are in nature? When I was young, they admitted of only two, magnetism and gravity. Now they tell us there are two more, the atomic forces, the strong and the weak interaction. All this must, I think, make the layman ask, is this the lot, or are there not other powers at work in the universe? But the scientists are right in requiring us only to believe in things for which there is real evidence. Evidence on poltergeists has not been easy to, to collect. 
for the reason that poltergeist outbreaks actually occur far more rarely than even the uncommon crime of murder. But statistics do disclose two odd and curious facts. It seems that in every afflicted household, the strange happenings tend to be mysteriously connected with just one member of the family. This person is usually a young person, someone in the age group 11 years up to 21 years old. And here perhaps we ought to pause for thought. Perhaps it really is all trickery. Perhaps it is just the kind of mischief that a young lad like that might be wanting to get up to. However, what of this housewife, 22-year-old Mrs. Marcia Howells of Swansea? She seems to me to be a most sincere and truthful witness. It was about three days after we moved into Ronda Street, my husband and I, we went to bed. And we woke up feeling as if somebody was choking us. My husband, he opened the windows, went downstairs to see if any gas had been left on, but nothing like that had happened. So we went to bed, we thought no more of that. Then my husband always locks the doors before going to bed. And one night I had to go downstairs and the door was open. So I locked it, went back to bed and told him he didn't lock the door, but he said he had. Then when we went downstairs in the morning, the door was open again. These things happened over a period of months. Then one afternoon, I was having tea with my mother in her room, and uh, it was on a Monday, and she said that she had to go across the shop. So I said, all right, I said, I'm going back to my room now to do a bit of work. So I, as I went out, the children came down the passage behind me. And I opened the door of my room and uh, I seen a bottle that is off the mantelpiece. I thought it was seeing things, so I uh, seen the bottle coming towards me, so I shut the door to protect myself and the bottle smashed against the back of the door. So I opened the door again and I seen another bottle rising off the mantelpiece. So I just shut the door and picked up the children and went and waited on the doorstep for my mother to come home. So she came back and I told her what had happened. So she said to me, oh, don't be so daft, she said. So we went back into the room and by that time all my furniture was upside down. So I waited on the doorstep again until my husband came home from work. And, uh, well, we didn't say nothing about it to anybody. We just cleaned up the mess. So then Tuesday, nothing happened strange at all. But it was on the Wednesday, my little girl, she was in nursery school. So it was about five to three. My mother was out in my room. So I said to her that, oh, I'd better go if I'm going to catch the bus. So she said, all right, I'll get the knitting from my room and come back. In the air with the baby. All right, I said. So I went to get the bus for school and uh, when I came back, my mother was on the doorstep, so I asked her what was the matter, and she said the same things had happened again, that all my furniture was upside down. So we both went in to have a look, so I could see that my room was in the same kind of a mess. So we went out the back kitchen to see if anything had been touched out there, Well, that was all right, nothing had been touched. So we went back, we went upstairs then to see if anything had been touched upstairs and upstairs was all right. So I said, come on, we wait on the doorstep for my husband to come home again. So we waited, we didn't hear no sound of anything at all. So when he came home, I said that my room was in the same kind of mess. Then we went on to the kitchen and uh, my gas stove was all turned up and uh, but we didn't hear any sound of anything. Then we went upstairs to go to see if the bedrooms were all right, and we couldn't open the bedroom door. So my husband said that he thinks that we better call the police. 
So I told him um, I was crying and I said that we better not call the police because we couldn't tell them that our furniture was flying about by itself. So well, anyway, he called the police and the police had to force the bedroom door open to get in. And uh, my big double bed was on top of the baby's cot behind the door. And, well, he always used to go to bed in the afternoon. I don't know why I didn't put him then. If he'd have been in it, he would have been killed. I don't think there was any trickery there. But we can do better than this. At Sochi, in Scotland, a few years back, a little girl of 11 years old, Virginia Campbell, was the centre of intense poltergeist activity, observed by many reliable witnesses, including the family physician, Dr. William Logan. He was called into the case because at school, her teacher had seen a desk rise and float about two inches above the ground. Dr. Logan recalls some of his experiences of five years ago. My first involvement with the Virginia Campbell poltergeist was in the evening of Saturday, the 26th of November, 1961. I was called to the house because of the incidents and happenings that had been taking there during that night and as it turned out on previous nights. When I arrived at the house, the householders were in a state of excitement and tension and informed me that there had been knockings and noises and pieces of furniture being moved and that uh, something odd was going on. So I, I went up to see the child, who was lying in bed, looking fairly relaxed, despite the obvious commotion that had been going on. And I asked her to try and forget as much as possible that I was in the room beside her. After I had been in the room for about oh, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, I noticed that one of the pillows beside Virginia was beginning to move in a rather unusual fashion. If you can imagine Virginia lying with her head on this pillow here and another pillow beside her. Now this pillow started to turn in a rotatory fashion. Thus, in addition, I noticed around about the same time or shortly afterwards that there was a an impression or indentation beginning to occur as if something was either pulling from the inside or pushing. But there was no obvious physical force bringing this movement about. I checked thoroughly that Virginia herself was in no position to bring about these odd movements, both by observation and by checking her position for hands and feet. Furthermore, there was no other person close enough to Virginia or the pillow to bring this about. Uh, I waited for a little while and only one other phenomenon occurred and this was a puckering of the bedclothes. Now, again, if you can try and imagine this piece of cloth as part of the coverlet on Virginia's bed, the bedclothes appeared to be pulled up and pulled towards Virginia, as if some force was trying to pull this coverlet. One of the noises was a very characteristic sawing sound. The other noise that was most common and present was a, a knocking, tapping noise, similar to this. After a short while, we decided to go home, thinking that perhaps Virginia would settle down and go to sleep once we had left. 
Just as we were going out the door, a very unusual thing happened. Well, it seemed unusual at the time. And that was the noises appeared to take on, the knockings appeared to take on a character in that they became extremely hurried and agitated as if um, something was trying to get us to stay in the room or attract the attention to the child in the bed. The noises became, as I said, agitated, something like this. Now that is the end of my own personal contact with these phenomena, but I have been given permission to read extracts from a diary that I suggested a close relative of the child should keep shortly after the event started. She noted down very carefully in her own words, by the way, this um, diary has never been published or read in any form before to the public um, and she was very kind in allowing me to read some extracts from it tonight. I would like to read the first uh, the description of the first night in which the phenomena started. It's dated Tuesday the 22nd of November 1960. At about 10.30 p.m. Margaret and Virginia were lying in bed. There was a noise like a ball bouncing on the floor. I looked under the beds in the room but couldn't see anything. No sooner had I left the room when it started again. Margaret and Virginia went downstairs thinking that perhaps a mouse was under the bed for a brush. The thing seemed to follow them down the stairs. A friend had just been visiting the house, and after he left, I quote, an apple jumped out of the dish. Virginia ate it. I went away to the phone. Virginia was in the house with Dad. He said, while I was away, an apple came out of the dish three times. The clock came off the cabinet and hit Virginia on the nose, settled on the chair just before I came back. Again, we read... A piece of chocolate jumped off the sideboard, also a pencil. A Brillo pad came out of the kitchen, into the living room. The light went on twice. Virginia was using the cleaner. It went off, and the rubber flew off the handle. There was a knocking under the table. Virginia gave three knocks. Then there were three knocks back. Later, she says, nothing happened this day. There was knocking on the table at dinner time. Someone was punching the girls in bed. On another occasion, the top of the hot water bag was opened, and they were scraping. The girls were getting pinched sore. Virginia's leg was getting tickled. There has been writing on the girls' faces for the past three nights. Virginia's lips went bright red three times there was a noise like a ball bouncing. Incidentally, this bright red description really, as far as I can make out, what she really intended to express was that, that, that Virginia's lips appeared to glow bright red. And this she saw herself. The bed cover turned red. It was a green cover. There was a noise like somebody walking across the floor. There was knocking on the bed, also on the mattress. And on occasions, she writes, all went well during the past two weeks. And she goes on again. There was a lot of knocking on the bed this morning. Virginia was getting nipped. Until we come to the last statement in the book, in which she just simply states, and it's dated Sunday, 23rd of April, 1961, there was a knocking on the cupboard door. The Socky Poltergeist case is, to my mind, a wonderfully diagnostic one. A living person, Virginia Campbell, was, for some weeks, at no wish of her own, the center of a mysterious force. This force was fitful and capricious. Sometimes it moved solid objects. At other times, it produced 
strange sounds. Here is a tape recording made by Dr. Logan. Unlike the good people at Tidworth, I do not think that it was a demon, or a goblin, or yet a disembodied spirit. I think it was a force, a force admittedly unknown to orthodox science, but yet a force proceeding in some way from Virginia herself. Until recently, in fact until two weeks ago, I thought of the Socky poltergeist case as the very pattern and type of all poltergeist cases. Now I have to tell you that I am beginning to think that there may be yet another kind of case of this sort, in some ways different, and in some ways akin to the old notion of the haunted house. And so I'm going to ask you to come with me in spirit, of course, to North Fleet in Kent. This is 16 Waterdale, North Fleet, Kent. Built about 30 years ago, it seems a perfectly normal house and not the kind we would expect to be haunted. But four years ago, a young couple, Mr. and Mrs. Maxted, moved in. Quite often, when Mr. and Mrs. Maxted were sitting downstairs in their sitting room, which is beneath where I am now, they would hear the sound of footsteps crossing the floor here in this room, although, in fact, it was at the time absolutely empty. Another thing which puzzled them a great deal, a strange smell permeated the house, an unpleasant chemical kind of smell that came and went mysteriously. But the Maxteads stuck it out, despite all their troubles and bewilderment, until finally Mrs. Maxwell saw a strange apparition. She awoke in the middle of the night, in fact, just about the time it is now. She saw, coming towards her, what seemed to be the figure of a little girl of about six years old. But as the vision advanced, it grew strangely taller and taller until it turned into a figure seen in profile and rather indistinct, but bending over her in an uncanny kind of way. After this, not unnaturally, the, Max, the Maxteads thought that enough was perhaps enough, and they moved out. But the house, though empty, was not at peace as Mrs. Margaret Harrison, who lives next door, can tell us. It never started off in the hall first, and then it came like a, well, you can't very well describe it, it's like a child's ball falling down the stairs. And it was, it was the sound, it was just going like that, all the way down the stairs, you know. And then it sort of shot, come to sort of shot up into the bedroom to where I was and um, it was like a like a scratchy noise, you know, under the bed. Um it sort of if it was bumping up the bed, you know, but it wasn't just in one part of the bed, you know, it was all over underneath. And it sort of was scratching all the time, you know. But it wasn't um, a sort of a clawing noise, you know, it was like that, you know, all the time, all under the bed. 
Although Mrs. Harrison lives next door, her bedroom is in actual fact above the stairway of number 16. After the Maxteads, Mr. and Mrs. Essex moved into the house. They too were persecuted. They also heard footsteps in the bedroom when no one was there, but also the noise of furniture moving. They too had a strange smell seeping through the house, but this time it was that of something old and musty rather than chemical. Then, one night, Mr. Essex was awakened by a strange whistling noise in his ears. He discovered his bed was being shaken. Indeed, it was being lifted up. Beside the bed, the weirdest of phantoms was forming itself. It glowed with a pinkish orange light. It was transparent at the edges. But, queerest and most peculiar of all, it was in the form of a woman, without a head. Well, I've spent now some six hours or so in the house at night. Nothing has so far happened. But I propose to stay on here until dawn, hoping, waiting for something to turn up. Well, the dawn did come, but nothing happened to me. I was not unduly disappointed because these things are notoriously wayward and fitful. However, North Fleet did leave me with an unanswered question. Is it possible that sometimes a place and the people in it can conspire together to generate a poltergeist energy? One big question hangs over the whole subject. Why is it that some people and not others can be a center for the poltergeist force. We know a little about this. We know that they tend to be young, are more likely to be girls than boys. We know that they are basically healthy, indeed rather intelligent, but possibly a trifle highly strung. Stress, it seems, and emotional tension can act as triggers helping to set off the manifestation. But clearly, this cannot possibly be all, for otherwise, poltergeists would afflict every home in the land. One thing is certain. These stories have happy endings. The effects are short-lived. Virginia Campbell today is a normal, happy, and charming teenager. What is the origin of the poltergeist force? I wish I knew. I regret I cannot tell you. All I know is that it exists. Why has it stayed unrecognized for so long? Perhaps it's because of the great variability of poltergeist cases. A milk bottle flew up, said Mrs. Howells. An apple rose out of the dish, said Dr. Logan. There were noises galore at Socky, and yet everything happened in complete silence at Swansea. Yet, where sounds did happen, it's very striking how similar they were, the scratchings and the bouncings long ago at Tidworth, and in our own time at North Fleet and in Scotland. I think myself that although it's physics, and its mode of application is mysterious and obscure, the poltergeist force itself has its origin in living human beings and not in ghosts or hauntings. However, the North Fleet case remains very puzzling to me and something of an exception to my theoretical scheme. There, the poltergeist activity the physical phenomena were all, it seems, attached to the house and not to the particular people in it. Just what influence it is and what awoke it to activity 
at 16 Waterdale and why it has brooded over the house these four years past is something that is going to remain for the time being unknown. <laughs>